to the world is brought to you by Gittens Pharmacare, the pharmacy that cares. Halifax Street, St. George's. Natural Cool, Spiceland Mall Grandans. Cool clothes for cool people. The Computer Store Grenada Limited, Spiceland Mall Grandans. The Gamers Paradise with headsets by Razer, Conair, JBL, Sony, Astro, Logitech, and more. And Island Catering, without a doubt, the best food and catering service on the island. Pharmacare, the pharmacy that cares. Halifax Street, St. George's. Affordable access to care, a wide range of prescription drugs, medical supplies, health and beauty items, diabetic testing supplies, immune system support products, vitamins, supplements, and lots more. Visit us today or call 440-2165. Ask about or call in prescriptions, discounted items, and special delivery requests. Kittens Pharmacare. Care, convenience, expertise. We've got it all. Good morning all. Good morning. And welcome to Green's Music to the World. Uh, I'm your host, Eugene Gittins. And uh, today in the studio, I've got a co-host, Ms. Janelle McDonnell. And uh, she'll be talking to you very soon. Um, we've got a very, very special show lined up for you today. I am told we'll be joined by viewers and listeners in St. Lucia, Barbados, Dominica, Trinidad, and of course, the Caribbean diaspora in North America. Welcome to you all. I want to thank the man JC, who was just here, as well as graphics over there in Hot FM, who are now joining us for keeping you here um, for us. We appreciate it. Um, we've got today two of the Caribbean's leading experts in the area of the creative industries and copyright. Dr. Keith Nurse and Dr. Erica Smith, respectively. They'll be joining us virtually to talk about the digital future of music and copyright in the Caribbean. If you are involved in any of the creative industries, music, art, writing, drama, design, fashion, craft, etc., stay tuned. This program is for you. Uh, we'll be opening up the lines and taking your questions and comments, but at this point, I'm going to turn you over to my co-host, uh, Janelle. Go ahead. Well, good morning to you, Mr. Gittins. Good morning to you, Grenada. Good morning to our esteemed panel, our listeners in the region. It takes a lot to get me out of my bed on a Saturday morning, but you, you had a fantastic program. I felt it was important, and so I'm here. I'm excited to be part of the program. And folks, as Mr. Gittins mentioned, you can follow us online on the website, www.gbn.gd, on television or on radio. You can also follow us on YouTube, on GBN's um, YouTube's page and or Facebook page as well as you can call us if you have any questions 435-2041 on the landline or if you're on WhatsApp no calls but you can send in you your text messages again to 435-2041 so it's an interactive forum I, I expect we'll learn a lot about copyright sometimes I get the plight of our artists you know not able to monetize their music and sometimes other people profiting while they're not so this discussion is very important and I think we should get it on the road Yes, uh, Janelle. And uh, not just copyright, but just the whole digital future of music, you know, it has and how, how music has changed. You know, the we don't have. Has changed. Remember, I, I look at my old records and my old CDs, <laughs> and, you know, sometimes I don't have the device to play them anymore. You, everything that, that's is, a challenge. Is, you know, a yeah, huge yeah. challenge. So everything is, is totally streamed and, and done differently now. Listen, um, I want to also at this point um, recognize a couple of people. Sure. Uh, starting with Mrs. Odette Campbell. She's a general manager here at the Grenada, Corp, um, Grenada Broadcasting Network. <laughs> um, I want to thank her for, first of all, allowing me to have this program here and also allowing me to do this uh, presentation here today. So thanks to Mrs. Campbell. I want to thank Preston Rastakari Holas. Um, he will be joining us too um, by Zoom. 
um, Preston had the idea for this program, came to me, we talked about it, and he, we, you know, followed up. So I want to thank uh, Preston for the idea and for following up. Uh, Jackie Cherbin Weeks out there in St. Lucia, she was a guest on this program a couple weeks ago. I want to say good morning to her and thank her for her support as well. And most importantly, or not most importantly, but but um, more sincerely, Dr. Keith Nurse and Dr. Erica Smith for volunteering their time and expertise so generously. We really appreciate it. I also want to recognize uh, Timon Perrot. He will be our um, producer slash person over there in Master Control who is going to make all this possible for us. Um, Donnell Thomas, Roy T. Jones, Krista Campbell, and Kevin Peterkin and Javon Francic for the beautiful flyers. And um, right now, uh, Janelle, I'm going to ask you to play Haiti. I'm sorry for me. Right. No. Yeah. Let's go. Okay. The Yankees gonna spout it. Uh -oh. I'm hearing something else. I'm hearing something else. I pull up. Oh no no no! I think I think Joseph oh, left go. left us with oh, some okay. music. <laughs> okay. But we we're good. Sorry, and I don't know how many more times you have to do this, how many times you've done it before, but we really have to do better. And um, we, we, we really want to make sure that um, we do much more than say sorry in the future. So, we just want to just uh, recognize Haiti at this point, um, all the things they're going through at this, at this point. Um, we're there with you, we empathize with you. I also want to recognize this week the birthday of the birdie. Um, Grenadian born, Slinger Francisco, uh, the mighty sparrow. He celebrated his 86th birthday um, this week. Uh, for those who don't know, he was born in Birch Grove. Uh, um, not Birch Grove, he was born in Grand Roy, sorry. He was born in Grand Roy, St. John, on July 8th, 1935. So that's Grand Roy, not Birch Grove. And of course, his parents migrated to Trinidad soon after he was born. Also celebrating his birthday this week is another, I call him a Grenadian Trini, <laughs> Grenadian born Trinidadian Calypsonian, Brother Valentino. He also celebrated his, um, I think, his 80th birthday uh, yesterday. So happy belated to him as well. Um, and for some of that information, I also just want to, especially for the one in Sparrow, thank the Grenadian Voice. They have a column, um, Grenada, this week in Grenada's history. It's a good column. It tells you a lot about what happened, you know, um, in Grenada in the past. And I just wanted to recognize them and give them credit for the information on, on Sparrow. Uh, okay, so... I think this might be a very good time to start things off officially and um, I would like to introduce um, Preston Dakari, if you could put him up on the, um, he will introduce, he will introduce um, Dr. Nurse. So we want to get Preston Rastakari Holas um, on Zoom for his introduction. Yeah, I think I'm hearing a little lawyer. Yeah? So yeah, mm, put him up right that, uh, opportunity to on your platform, which I know is uh, is heard wide, not only in the spice and the diaspora, but on the worldwide web. It's uh, it's uh, it's an honor to be in such a panel and to also introduce a stalwart like Dr. Nurse. Before I do that, um, I would like to also join with you and. Uh, sending my condolences to Haiti because you know when I used to work with, with Skasha which was one of the top Haitian dance band in the 70s they made me an honor, honorary Haitian so I, I, I feel it for my people um, okay let me say a couple of things about the man you know it, it's I met him in, I think, around 1996, 97 in Trinidad, I was invited by COT, which is the Copyright Organization of Trinidad. And he was the featured speaker at that convention. And um, I was in awe with his prowess in terms of um, the research that he had done on the whole uh, subject of the creative industry slash copyrights and uh, 
trade, tourism, etc. Now, Dr. Ness is a consultant to international, regional, national agencies such as OAS, CARICOM, CARIFORUM, UNESCO, Caribbean Expo Development Agency, and the Tourism Industry and Development Company of Trinidad and Tobago. He was also a former director of Entertainment Industry Expo Development Company, a former coordinator of Arts and Cultural Enterprise Management. Now, he has many publications, but I just want to mention a few. Tourism, Trade and Services, and Global Value Chains. Culture as the fourth pillar of sustainable development. Creative industries for youth, unleashing their potential and growth. Paradigm shift, which he spoke about when he was in that convention in 1996. The key dimensions of the increasingly digitized creative economy and the implications for the diversification of developing economies. And finally, culture and human development, which, which was a policy paper. Should I say more, folks? I hope everybody is taking note. Get your recorders out, get your pen and pencil, and let's go to school. Dr. Ness, it's a pleasure, and welcome to the Spice Country and the whole audience. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Rastakari. Um, you take me down memory lane. Um, in fact, you called some publications that I had even forgotten. <laughs> so, and you're really dating me. So, thanks very much for that as well uh, to the audience. Yes, yes. Um, I've been tracking the digitalization process for a very long time now. In fact. I wrote a paper which is published in the Social and Economic Studies in 2000 entitled um, Digital Music and Copyright in the Caribbean. Uh, so that, that, that's 21 years ago. And, um, and things have progressed rapidly since then. And in particularly under COVID, but definitely in the last um, seven or eight years, we've seen a very rapid process of digitalization. And um, there's no longer a question mark about it in people's minds. Um, we all have the devices, uh, we're all consuming content uh, digitally. And in many respects, the music industry is the, is the industry that has been the path-breaking um, element in bringing digitalization to people's lives. I don't think people realize that, but the most digitized um, content on the planet is music. And it is music that has made uh, many of the devices um, and the platforms um, viable. So I, I know you said that I'm going to take people to school this morning. I'm, I'm trying not to be too much of a, of an academic stroke presenter. But I wanted to share a bit of um, data with um, our audience, our audience in Grenada, um, the Caribbean, and the world. Um, I mean, this morning I went on to Billboard to see, um, you know, where are some of the Caribbean artists located on, on Billboard? And um, I looked at the top 200 on Bill, Billboard, which is the, the music. Um, publication that captures data on sales, particularly in the United States. And in the top 200, there are only two Caribbean artists, um, and they're all women. Um, Nicki Minaj is ranked number 159 um, with her album, uh, Be Me Up Scotty, and, uh, and Rihanna is at 172 with her um, album, Auntie. Um, so Caribbean women are flying the flag and representing well for us in the region. But once you start looking for data on the Caribbean music industry, you are hard pressed to find good information and data upon which to make um, a clear assessment of where things are at. So um, I have some slides. 
I don't know if you would permit me to 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 share them with you. Um, let's hold one second. Let's see if I can do this quickly. Post the video. Yeah, you um, you guys have to let me um, access the the screen screen sharing. Okay, one second. Yeah. We're working on it. Um, yeah. Well, I can. I can. I'll start mm -hmm. in any event. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at what's happening to the music industry uh, since 2016, 2017, um, it's been defined as an inflection year. What they mean by that is this: is that the digital sources of income from the music industry, uh, like streaming in particular. Uh, and as well downloads have outpaced the other sources of income from the music industry. So that means that um, streaming, downloading, and other forms of digitalization uh, earn more than physical revenue, meaning income from the sale of music items, um, whether you're talking about a CD or a DVD and so on. So that market has shrunk quite considerably. But if you take back the analysis even further, uh, the digitization process impacted music uh, in a significant way. Since 2004, music revenue generally um, had been at about $40 billion, and it declined all the way down to about $24 billion in the formal areas. Um, and so we've been working our way back out of that trough. And so, but as we've, the music industry has grown since 2014, 2015, um, digitalization has been a key growth area. And so one can say in the last six, seven, eight years, that digitalization has really taken off. Dr. Nance, seeing, what, let me interrupt you one second. Sure. You, please, you can share your screen now. Go right ahead. Okay. And so what we've been seeing since COVID is that this process has become even accelerated. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so this process has become even more accelerated. Uh, with COVID. And so, um, you know, 10 years ago, many of the names on this slide um, didn't exist, like TikTok, uh, Spotify, um, Pandora, uh, Vivo maybe, uh, Apple Music. Uh, but they are now the key drivers of, um, of music sales globally. They've replaced the music companies. So the music companies are no longer on the front line. It's the platforms that are in the front line of the um, distribution and sale of music. What does this mean? Well, this slide shows the, the rapid decline in um, since 2004 of music revenue associated with the recording industry. Now, what has happened is that the income being generated from music is happening in other industries, like in telecommunications, in e-commerce, um, and in digital platforms. So whereas the data that is being shown here is for recording companies, um, there is income being generated in other sectors. Now, this is a really important point to make because um, music and the creative industries are no longer a standalone industries. Maybe they never were, but now they flow into the income from a whole range of other sectors. Um, and so we need to take that very much into account. So what we've seen is that um, um, there's a significant growth in streaming. Streaming is the fastest growing component in the music industry and things like physical revenue and even downloads have declined quite 
uh, significantly in recent years. Um, and so you see this process of digitalization taking place uh, across the board. If you look at Eden, uh, this is an article from Music Week um, from last year, and it says that music is responsible for 83% of the videos excluded, in exceeding 1 billion views on YouTube. So on YouTube, music is the most important um, thing that has been accessed and downloaded or, or streamed. Uh, and music is becoming more valuable year over year as a share of total streams and total shares and total downloads and so on. So music is really the key engine of growth of creative digitalization, or what we're now calling the digital creative economy. Um, I published an, a paper for the World Trade Organization uh, last year, um, so you could look it up. And, um, and I talk extensively about how this process of digitalization is impacting on the creative sector. And the creative sector impacting on the wider global economy. Now, th this is some data that's showing you that, um, you know, how much money do you need to, or how many streams do you need to have to earn one dollar on these platforms? So on YouTube, you have to have 1,400 plus uh, streams to generate one dollar. And if YouTube is the dominant um, player or platform, then you can see that it is quite uh, a task to generate uh, a standard of living purely from music. Right? So the other slide, element of the slide shows the average payout per stream. So Napster pays out more money, but very few people are accessing Napster. Remember Napster? For those of you who've been in this business for a long time, it was probably the first major um, player in terms of distributing music on a peer-to-peer -peer platform and was very much associated with a lot of the infringement of music. Um, and I'm sure my colleague uh, Erica Smith will talk more about it. But so this shows you the landscape of the various platforms that are engaged in uh, distributing music globally. But what I want to come to now is talk about what are the implications for developing countries? If you look at the data for world exports of cultural and recreational services, the dominant players are the usual ones, uh, Europe and North America, followed by Asia. But South America, South Central America and the Caribbean um, is about half of Asia, Africa and the Middle East are, are pretty far behind. Um, if you look at the other side of the slide, it shows um, comparing 2010 and 2019. What's alarming is that um, South and Central America share has dropped quite considerably. We are operating at half of what we were in 2010. North America has also declined, Europe has grown, but, and Asia has grown. Africa is about steady state. So it means then that in the era of digitalization, um, South Central America and the Caribbean is becoming increasingly uncompetitive in this area. And you know, the irony of all ironies is that um, a large share of popular music comes from the Americas. It's the Americas that has been the main driver of growth in popular music globally. But other parts of the world are, are catching up. But other parts of the world have better infrastructure for capturing the income and the data from music. So if you look at the collections, this is royalty collections by region. It shows that North America and Europe are the dominant ones, Europe being the largest, of course, followed by Asia Pacific and Latin America and the Caribbean is only 5%, Africa is 1%. And it becomes even more disturbing when you look at the data from what we call the average collections of copyright by number of inhabitants. Europe is way ahead. So um, when a song is played in Europe, um, 
its capacity to generate income is almost 60 times higher than it is in Latin America and Caribbean and Africa and Asia. All right, so there's a huge disparity in terms of the capacity of these economies and societies to monetize music and to monetize creative content. So I've used this slide for many uh, presentations. Really, in the Caribbean and in many other developing countries, we have three options. We could go for status quo, which is what we generally do, because in the Caribbean and many other parts of the developing world, we talk a big talk, but we do very little in terms of action, in terms of implementing a strategy, building the infrastructure, particularly for these kinds of industries, because we don't understand how to build industries that are not brick and mortar. So we understand how to put up a hotel, maybe. Um, but we don't understand how to generate the income associated with either some of the services or the intellectual property. And increasingly, how to monetize data. Because it's your capacity to monetize data that's going to be the big growth element of the music industry and the creative industries generally going forward. So we haven't even begun to capture our IP or copyright income, far more for the data flows that are going to be associated with it. Problem with staying in the status quo mode is that more than likely because you are not investing in your upgrade or industrial upgrading, you're going to end up in reversal mode, which is where the Caribbean generally is. It doesn't matter what sector you talk about in the Caribbean. It could be agriculture. Right? We import more food per capita than anywhere else in the world. It could be health. We have the highest um, chronic non communicable disease profile in the world. Um, it could be tourism. Right, Our net value earnings from tourism is very low. Uh, and similarly, what we're seeing in the cultural and creative industries because of a level of underinvestment is that we are generating increasingly lower levels of returns. Um, so what I've been proposing is that we need to move towards a process of reinvention. And this applies to almost every sector, including education, where I'm, uh, I'm very much involved. If you're not reinventing yourself, you are in reversal. And you should expect to have declining levels of income and declining levels of uh, standard of living. It's, that's a given if you are not investing in the future. And so some of the things that were required are for us to invest heavily in the digitalization process, um, not just in the creative industries, but if you're not training people in terms of digital education, for example, or boosting your intellectual property institutions like copyright management organizations, uh, or you're not ensuring that your population has access to broadband at a fairly affordable rate. That means your telecommunication sector needs to be uh, better organized to deliver um, access at a cheaper rate, um, then you are not going to be able to engage in this process of, of reinvention. Um, I'll just end by saying there are at least four things we need to do at a minimum. Um, of course, we need to boost the domestic content and exports and so on. We need to train people about digital entrepreneurship. And that's something that we are aiming to do starting um, later this year at the Sarto Lewis Community College. We're running an academy on digital and creative um, entrepreneurship. And we need to build our own platforms by aggregating our content and making it accessible to the world. Thirdly, you have to be able to measure it. If you're not measuring it, then it means that you're not managing it. And that's the case in the Caribbean. And I've been talking about this ad nauseum now for more than 20 years. If you look at the data, there's very little that we can have um, access to uh, outside of the data from the copyright institutions, which I'm sure Erica will talk about. And then last but not least, I'm sure Erica will be happy to hear me say this, uh, we need to strengthen copyright administration and management because it's our copyright organizations where, um, that are going to be capturing the, both the data 
and the income from the digitalization process. So it's no longer sales of physical items. Um, and the concert and touring has been impacted ne negatively by COVID, as you can see, as well as the capacity of tourists to come to visit our territories for carnivals and other events. And so where are we going to make income or generate income in the music industry? It has to be through digitalization and copyright administration. So I will end on that note and thank you very much for your kind attention. And that's, uh, let's see what we get in terms of question and answers. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Nurse. Remember, again, folks, you can send in your questions via um, the WhatsApp platform, 435-2041. Only written questions, no calls. You can also send them in via Facebook. You can call us in the studio, 435-2041, if you're calling from your landline or mobiles. But if you WhatsApp, only messages. Um, Mr. Gittins, you want to take this one we have on Facebook? Sure. Um, we have a um, we, we have one here. Um, how do we fill out those requested tax information on the distribution and copyright forms living here in Grenada? I'm not sure. That may be a question for um, Dr. Um, Erica. Um, instead of uh, I don't know, um, Dr. Nurse, can you can you address that? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you. That, that's a question more for Erica. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, the, the key point, though, is this. Um, most of our artists and entrepreneurs in the creative sector um, are required to become increasingly better organized. Um, you know, filing their taxes, um, uh, establishing their companies, establishing their presence in social media um, and so on. In fact, um, what is now required is that our creative producers become digital entrepreneurs. Uh, we don't have a choice anymore. So you, it's almost as though they are digital entrepreneurs first and creatives second, um, because that's the way in which the industry is moving. And so, um, you know, doing all the documentation is a critical part of that process. But I'll leave it to Erica to talk about the specifics. Thanks very much. Okay. We I'm not sure mm -hmm. which form specifically, but if they mean the forms for the U.S., I would really, I would suggest to just um, send me an email. Um, we, we have sometimes to assist our members with that. So if, if they send me an email, erica, E-R-I-C-A, at C-O-S-C-A-P.org, um, I'll have someone in my office assist you. Thank you for that. Great. Um, we also want to have the people um, who, the, the specially invited guests who are in there, in the room with the presenters. Um, you guys, please go ahead. Um, we have people like the CEO of the um, some Spice, of the people, Mask. Spice Mask um, Corporation. Calvin Jacob. To, to name out some of the people we have in there. And they can go ahead and ask questions at this point as well. Um, yes. Um, Calvin, any questions from you for, for um, Dr. Nurse? No, I don't have any questions as yet, but a um, very good presentation. Very good presentation. Okay. Um, Andrew Hitz, Philip, any questions from you for Dr. Nurse? As an entertainer, um, I'm sure yeah. you'd have some. <laughs> Actually, no. He, he definitely gave a lot of um, succinct and well-explained information, a lot of information that a lot of young and aspiring as well as established artists can benefit from. What I would like to comment to, though, is the tax form, because I've had to do it for, some, for quite a couple of years. It's... Um, I, I, my experience with it, if I can just share that briefly, is that it's not too it's not too difficult to fill out, but it is necessary for you to understand it more so than just fill it out and get it submitted. So um, not just the people who would email, but in general, I just want to kind of echo the fact that um, 
we need to, as creatives, learn as much as possible about all these aspects, do as much research. Um, Google is a, is a world library. You can get as much information on all these different topics online. And the more you know, the better it is for you. Okay, great. Um, Dr. Nils, um, someone just sent us a, um, a release basically stating that D Music is a digital platform. D Music emerges as leading digital music streaming platform for the region. How um, can artists, how, how do they benefit from that? Yeah, I, if I recall, that's, that's a platform um, on the Digicel? Yes. Operations. Yes, um, I haven't looked at their numbers because it's only in the last uh, year or two that they've really picked up um, and built capacity there. Um, but I was involved in some of the initial discussions about pursuing this. And so um, I think one of the key concerns was the payout rate. Uh, I don't know what it is specifically at this point. Uh, but one of the challenges is this. Um, how, how are we tapping into the regional market? And then how are we tapping into the diaspora market? And um, I haven't seen the data on it. It's probably proprietary data. So uh, that's something that we need to take a little bit better look at. But it's an important um, development, which can, um, I think, help to catapult the industry uh, to the next level, because that has been our biggest um, challenge, finding a platform that would um, boost um, exports from the region in the digital environment. Okay. Um, if you don't have any more... Uh, uh, no, let's oh, just open it up again. Um, so in the, in the room there, um, Jackie Cherbin Weeks, any questions from you? Yes, good morning to everyone, um, and especially Dr. Nurse and Dr. Smith. It's so nice having you all here, that we can access your knowledge, because you all are dearth of knowledge, um, wealth of knowledge, and I'm really, really happy to be on this panel. Um, I represent in St. Lucia the Association of Musicians, Producers, and Performers of St. Lucia, Amp St. Lucia for short. Um, and one of the things that we are trying to do is education to our members. And we've recently done a series of workshops. And some of it is really educating our members. In fact, I heard Andrew Hitz uh, the other day, I was very impressed with his knowledge as a producer and musician. But a lot of our members, our musicians, producers, performers, need to have education on what they should and shouldn't do um, in terms of all what you were talking about, uh, Dr. Nurse, and also, of course, the copyright. But very importantly, filing your income tax returns, um, paying your in, in NIC, what we call NIC in St. Lucia, national insurance, things like that. Um, we find that there's a very big difficulty of actually getting data on the music industry in St. Lucia. And I'm sure it's the same thing for a lot of the Caribbean islands because there's, there is not any tangible way of artists, if they don't file their income tax returns, for instance, the Inland Revenue Department has no data. Um, our statistical department has no data. So then it's very difficult to even show the government the contribution to GDP, and then for the government to say, well, hey, this is really an important industry, so we're going to invest in it. So we have that situation everywhere and I, I think especially in St. Lucia that's where I live and where I've, I've been involved for many many years in the music industry and I just think that we need a lot of education not only for our members but also for our government officials um, 
they need to be educated on the systems in the music industry and there, there just needs to be more awareness and more education i don't know if you agree with me doctor doctor nurse but this is my observation uh, thanks very much jackie uh, good to see you on screen at least <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay well you know that um since Russia is the number number one ranked country in the Caribbean in terms of its contribution to copyright industries. All right, so 8% of the GDP, if I remember correctly, based on the World Intellectual Property Organization studies. Um, uh, so, so St. Lucia has 8% of its GDP comes from copyright industries which would include things like broadcast operators, radio stations, television stations, newspapers, and so on. So St. Lucia has a, quite a lot of those. Um, so that would probably be the biggest source. Then it would be your, things like your festivals um, would be a major contributor as well. And so festival tourism is a major source of earnings, particularly when you had the jazz festival uh, up and running and, and it's at its peak. Um, your music exports and your exports of, for example, of visual arts and so on would, an, would be another area of contribution. Um, but we have been tracking these things consistently over time. So um, I would expect that it's still about the same, but we need to monetize that to sell the idea to the government of St. Lucia. And I know you all are aware, elections coming up soon yes. Yes. We, we, we need to make sure that that's part of the um campaign and the uh, manifestos <laughs> and <then> the manifestos <laughs> yes um but there's no denying that the copyright or co cultural or creative industries has a big impact on the economy of saint lucia it is really up to people like yourself and i to champion this cause put the data forward uh, as best as we have, because, you know, um, we can't wait for the perfect moment when we have all the data. Sure. We can utilize what we now have and, and make the point and make the argument. And I think we have sufficient data to really uh, elevate the discussion to another level. What is required though is a shift in perspective because by and large, we think that the main governmental institution that we need to be interfacing with is the ministries of culture. Now, ministries of culture all across the Caribbean, with one or two exceptions, are a very weak institution in terms of promoting these industries. All right, so in Trinidad and Tobago, for example, it's the Ministry of Trade that has been facilitating the growth in the music industry through the, the company called Creative TT. Yes. Uh, then they've, so they've created um, music TT, they have fashion TT, and then they have film TT. And that's how they've been driving the, the industrial growth. I would recommend the same for St. Lucia and several of the other Caribbean countries. Um, uh, it's the capacity within our ministries of culture is weak. They don't have the personnel, they don't have the budget, um, and the orientation isn't about industrial enterprises and, and trade and exports and so on. So I, I wouldn't expect our ministries of culture to be able to do what we're asking them to do. Yes, you're right. Yeah. So. Very right, very right. Thank you very much for that. And I hope that we'll be able to get together sometime in the future. Yeah, to man. Talk about this. Yes. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, we saw raised hands from Andrew Hitz. Philip, you had a question or comment? Yes. Uh, yeah, I finally got a question. So, um, uh, Dr. Nurse, can you elaborate a little bit more for us on the importance of infrastructure and branding for the creatives? Infrastructure in the sense of putting the right people in place um, for success. For example, having the right... Um, manager or whether someone's a publicist or you know putting a team together to, that can specialize in different areas and really build a brand and thinking of yourself 
as a company as opposed to just thinking of yourself as artist or uh, a creative thinking yourself as a product and having a ceo so to say a coo etc in place to make to get you to that place you want to get to all right thank you those are two uh, really critical uh, elements of the equation so let me start with the branding that that's a little bit um easier and closer to whom one can argue so you're right um how do people make money in the creative industries um so yes people sell their music let's say um whether it's embodied in a good like a cd or dvd whether it's embodied embodied in a service so for example a concert or a tour or in terms of the intellectual property like copyright generating copyright um what we are seeing though is that increasingly especially a top brand artists can generate income from corporate sponsorship from their social media presence on youtube and, and other platforms um and we're also seeing some artists you know like from trying to be go marshall montano generates income from what we call intellectual property branding so he's branding chocolates rum um you name it okay so brand identification um and the earnings from that has been a huge growth element if you are a popular artist okay so um, but even artists who are not necessarily so popular can generate income from these um, platforms as well so for example in your music video you could have product placement so a particular um, company's product can be displayed you know artistically in your music video and you can generate income from that source so i mean it's estimated that there are 120 different ways to generate income from music so um so the, the, you know there's lots of possibilities there so that's one side of the to this question or comment you made the second element is the infrastructure question and the infrastructure question really now relates to not what artists can do for themselves as much as what governments and, and the corporate community needs to put in place to facilitate. So here we're talking about things like e-commerce platforms. We're talking about uh, access to broadband at a, an affordable rate, which I mentioned earlier. But what's happening is this, to the music industries and creative industries, is that we have entered the era of what is now being called digital intelligence and it's really now your capacity to have smart platforms that are generating data but also allowing for data monetization and this is where our governments in the region need to be um, far more astute so in countries like south korea or india and brazil they're big company, uh, big countries with, with large populations, um, and they are ensuring that data localization is something that they have greater control over. Over What is meant by data localization? I won't give you the full thesis on it now, but basically, in most countries, or almost all countries except the ones I just mentioned, um, Google, YouTube, Facebook, and so on, are using our data, well, they're collecting our data and selling it on. What data localization allows is for local entrepreneurs and local firms and local platforms to access the same data and utilize it for their commercialization um, opportunities. Um, so unless our governments facilitate data localization, you won't have local the growth of local platforms or even regional platforms that can generate income from data monetization. And so um, this is a critical area going forward. And most developing countries don't have the political prowess to push on this far more than knowledge about it. Um, so that, 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 that's the infrastructure part. 
we call it digital infrastructure element of the equation going forward. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Simon, I see you have a question, but hold on one second. Let's just take one from WhatsApp. Um, the comment is saying Dr. Nurse touches on an important point which I want to take up. The question of training and building strong institutions with clear objectives must be addressed. It cannot be an individual asking about accessing a form. Issues like that should be an administrative issue. Um, he goes on to say there is no formal training in the schools around the arts. We have no clear objectives what we want the arts to do for us as a society. And they go on to say as well, I agree with Nurse about the weak institutions in the Caribbean. Can this be the focus of future discussions? Any comments, Dr. Nurse? Oh, I've been talking about this ad nauseum for a long time. Eh? <laughs> but I just don't talk. I actually um, engaged in building institutions, so... For example, at the St. Augustine campus at UWI, I started something, it must be almost 15 years ago now, called Arts and Cultural Enterprise Management, where we've been training people on, on these sectors and areas um, for some time now. Um, but that needed to be replicated on all the campuses in, U in the University of the West Indies. Um, in, in Jamaica, they started something more recently, last five years or so. Um, in Barbados, um, it hasn't been established. Um, that's something I'm working on building in St. Lucia at the St. Louis Community College um, in the next couple of months. Um, this is really important huh? because like any other industry, it's your human resources and your expertise that makes the difference. Do you understand what is required in the industry? What is involved in, um, in building capacity, in marketing, in data monetization, right? We have to train people on these, on these things. Otherwise, they're going to run right past us. And in many respects, they are. All right, I would suggest that in, if we don't build a digital infrastructure in the next five years, um, these industries will have, you know, will no longer be as accessible to us in terms of generating income. So, for example, who are the top um, artists in terms of global sales of reggae? They're not Jamaicans. Um, so if you take Bob Marley out and maybe Shaggy and one or two others, right, the bulk of the sales of the top artists in reggae are not from Jamaica. They're from the United States. They're from Japan. They're from South Africa. They're from Brazil and so on. You, if you go to the, the, the music trade fairs, Everybody is selling reggae, you know. There's Italian reggae, there's Greek reggae, there's Malaysian reggae, um, you just name it. Everybody is selling reggae. And so, um, J J reggae doesn't belong to Jamaica anymore. Same thing is happening to soca. It's spreading all around the world. Same thing is happening to steel pan, right? There, there's 200 steel bands in, where is it? Um, Sweden or something like that. Um, this thing is, our culture is spreading around the world very rapidly, you know. How many carnivals, Caribbean carnivals are there outside of the Caribbean? By my estimate, there's over 200. Are we generating the income from these festivals? And the answer is very little, um, except our artists performing occasionally in these events. How many reggae um concerts and events are there all around the world um, my colleague from jamaica has been capturing this data and uh, um sonia um right we are no longer in control of our creative um ingenuity and contribution to the world we have put it out into the world and we haven't built the institutional capacity into the training the people to take advantage of the opportunities and to leverage it. Now, this is important, not just for generating income, but for securing our identity and the future of our generations. Uh -huh. So um, 
I can't begin to underscore how important this is. Um, of course, I'm an educator, and I would argue that we need more training, but it really has to do with um, building capacity to, um, you know, to monetize the content, to generate the exports, um, and so forth. This is our gift to the world and gift to humanity. So we need to secure it better, I would argue. I agree. I agree. Um, Simon, the final question is yours before we, we go to break. All right. Um, I must say I was quite impressed by the presentation this morning, Dr. Merce, and thank you again for making time for us here to really discuss this very important issue. Um, in terms of just basic, let's say, geographical indicators as to what is Caribbean music, um, what we own as a cultural space, and, and, and how we package those things um, for us now and the future, that was really, you know, the, the question I wanted to raise. I mean, you kind of expound a little bit in it a little while ago. But I think beyond that, that if you're going to be talking about industry, um, we have a lot of indigenous art forms here, as you say, you know, whether it's Zook, Calypso, Reggae, you know, Steel Pan, that we have allowed to just kind of afloat out there. And um, many others are, are benefiting, let's say, um, from it. So I want to suggest one of the things that we can do as a region, we have persons like you, Dr. Ness and others, who I'm sure would be very much um, pleased to be a part of some kind of think tank that could be um, used to sort of uh, brainstorm an industry that could be built from the ground up. I'm talking a multi-sectoral approach. The historians and the writers, the researchers, or people in our hemisphere, you know, of Caribbean background, um, who understands the history of our music, our arts, and, and how we can benefit to kind of construct this without, let's say, um, interference from the politics, but of course, facilitation and, and right facilitation by the political realms to ensure that uh, we can do this thing well. Um, it's one thing trying to benefit from streams and platforms that are made by people outside of our region and um, who, of course, benefit from us, you know, and um, to some extent, some people may say it continues the enslavement or exploitation of our artists. Um, you know, we have so much popular music that um, people are using and, and, and ripping us from, uh, ripping out, let's say, from us, that um, I think it's about high time that we really sit down. We have enough technical and, um, you know, other persons in the region who can do this. I am quite convinced we have. So instead of running over to other platforms like Spotify or whoever else may exist, um, I think it's really important for us to start to build our industry from scratch and drive the traffic to us, as opposed to always running and trying to pay catch up. I think for a long time, we have kind of a, you know, can imagine a success as to how many people, let's say, appear on an American top 40 or a European top 40. Why not create something here that channels people to look at us as a serious, you know, um, force, a really organized uh, region that is producing excellent quality art for the world to consume and ensure that um, all of our persons, whether you're on the technical side of things or the creative side of things in terms of making the music or the business or legal side, can participate and benefit from it. So um, again, thanks for this presentation and it's really inspiring a lot of thought. Okay, thank you, Simon. Um, we had, before you respond, Dr. Ness, we had a caller on the line waiting. Let's just take that caller before we get your comment. Caller, you, you're there with us still? Yes, I'm here. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, what I'm listening to this gentleman, uh, the gentleman, and all that saying in there is very perfect. And But over the years, as an elderly person in Grenada, for the time... Yes, we have carnival going. Right now, the carnival we have is not like, it's, you don't have any beauty and structure as in the 60s, 50s, and 70s. And what even the other 
a, a couple of days ago on a program, I heard up one of the politicians said about competition, and that is a problem. We're not supposed to be talking competition in Grenada. We're supposed to be talking working together. So what the gentleman is even saying, you see how the Calypsonian go now there and everybody trying to make a name for themselves. We're supposed to have a body controlling these things where all our culture is in one But Look, right now, because of the COVID, we have such an opportunity to put all our things in place for the next carnival that's going to come because the next carnival that's going to come be going to be a big carnival carnival but it's going to be more just a jump and you throw some black thing on yourself and jump up and say jab jab and we having fun carnival like the gentleman saying look look at look at what i look about in the steel band you want to produce culture look how many steel band in grenada go and look at the, the steel band house the government should make sure that all every year every two years you make sure that one of these bands have a proper house the culture if you don't start with the foundation and build the foundation everything is fragment fragment in grenada but we have to come together and work together not this competition everything is in copy we have to work together because we are working against ourselves if you go to school and you, you make competition and your children, your teachers, every Grenadian, we all over, all over. Look at the diaspora, how many people supporting, trying to get in the museum. When you go to the, mu the museum, you're supposed to have an area there where you can go and all the various mass camps should have some representation there in the museum so you can see. There's no place where you're going to train to do wire bending or anything. All countries are taking away everything. As the gentleman said, Japan, a hundred steel bands. Don't talk about China. China have a, you have one in the Philippines too. There are hundreds of steel bands. One band in, in, in Japan is to about two, three in Grenada steel band and there's carnival all over and the people are trying to make a proper name of themselves like coming together we are so small every day the preaching competition all the gentlemen are saying is very right but i could remember in the early days and if these people know about in the days are like bushy tops and then the people in carnival when they're doing the stage well, this man is from Trinidad, so you know all about the days of Brasorama in Trinidad and all this, this thing and thing. But we, you see the Jamaicans, they are more together, although they have to do a lot, but they are more together. They're selling the music. Where is our music? Competition, we only, competition is not for Grenada. We work together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kola, for your input there. We appreciate the feedback. Um, Mr. Gittins, you wanted to make a comment before we hear from Dr. Nurse again? Yeah, well, I'm going to go ahead. No, I think we're going to go ahead and let Dr. Dr. Nurse answers, answer those last two questions, and then we want to move on. We will take a commercial break, mm -hmm. and then we're going to move on to the second part of the pre presentation um, from, well, the second presentation right. from um, Dr. Smith. Erica Smith. Okay. Yeah. to the world is brought to you by Gittens Pharmacare, the pharmacy that cares. Halifax Street, St. George's. Natural Cool, Spiceland Mall Grand Dance. Cool clothes for cool people. The computer store... Um, within the creative sector, um, um, almost a, let's call it a disciplinary um, approach, which is focused on one art form at a time. When in fact, in a digitalization, framework um, you are now working with multiple or composite art forms so music is no longer just a standalone because you have to produce or generate a video uh, but um, you know most films have I mean all films have song tracks um, and they generate income for um, creative producers, uh, authors and composers, and so on. So in fact, you, can be, you may be able to generate more income from having your, your music in a film than from any other source, especially if it is able to um, be attached to a very popular um, film. 
Um, and the list goes on, and, and Erica could explain more about that, I presume. Um, so the tendency is to think in, um, in very monolithic um, terms, uh, that there's one channel that you can do this in. So for example, I do workshops for the film industry. I'm the chairman of the Caribbean Tales Worldwide Distribution, we're the largest distributor of film in the world from the Caribbean or Caribbean film. And we do workshops with filmmakers every year to explain to them that a film can generate income from box office, yes. Royalty income, yes. But you can also generate income from merchandising, that you could generate income from generate creating a book or toys. Um, and the list goes on and on and on. The creative industries is a circular economy, a transversal economy and not a standalone economy. So that's the first point. The second point is that every industry needs to have an industry association that is advocating on its behalf, um, generating the, the level of, of um, exposure to its membership and collecting the data and information about its membership to utilize it for leveraging with uh, and lobbying and for advocacy. Um, if you're not doing that, if you don't have an industry association or one that represents the wider collective for the creative industries, then you are not going to be in a position to advance your interests. And that's been the case for most Caribbean countries. Um, if you go to the Bahamas though, they've had a, um, a music association there since 1947. Um, uh, and they have been able to got to get instituted certain mechanisms that have generated higher levels of uh, royalty income for them over these decades. Uh, so having an industry association is really important. Um, the third point is that things are moving very rapidly. Um, so to produce a TikTok video. Um, and generate income. And how does then that splice into your social media presence on Instagram, um, Instagram TV, Facebook TV? You now can create your own channels, your own broadcast channels for the content and for its distribution. However, you're competing with everybody in the world. So how do you then generate um, that additional value added in terms of building your brand? So let me give you an example from Grenada, right? Grenada's Jab Jab Rhythm is the boss. It's my favorite Jab Jab Rhythm in the world. I know my Trinidadian friends won't be too happy for me to say that, but at Juve time, there is no better rhythm to ride on than the Grenadian Jab Jab Rhythm. All right, All right. and you, have, you guys all have that, that down to, to um, you know, it, it's, it's excellent, let me put it that way. But then you have costumes like short knee, which are very distinctive that you can't find in many other locations. How is that being uh, elevated and distributed? Uh, are people doing TikTok videos, utilizing short knee um, costumes on a jab jab rhythm? Um, how are, can that then be spliced into the, the uh, Grenada Pure um, tourism campaign? Um, so now it's associated with your tourism product. Um, and the list goes on and on. We are no longer thinking about standalone industries. Huh? And that's what we need to be looking at. Last point. Um, Erica and I have been working on these issues for a long time now. But one of the things is that for the music industry, we need to create um, a digital platform, but that requires that we have uh, a large share of the music rights in the Caribbean being accessible on um, a, 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 what we call a clean database where the rights are cleared. Um, and some of these things can then be used as a, this platform can be used as a basis to distribute to multiple platforms, whether you talk about Apple Music, Spotify, Pandora, Tidal, 
Napster, you name it, um, as well as the music on the. Um, so I'm sure Erica can talk more about it because we've made some advancement, and Erica and her colleagues in the copyright um, sector have, I think, done us um, human service in the last few years in this regard. So I'll, I'll end on that note and thank you for your kind um, invitation to participate in this morning's session. Uh, over to you. Yes, we'll take a we'll take a commercial break. We'll take a commercial break and we'll, we'll be right back. Thank you. Green's Music to the World is brought to you by Gittins Pharmacare, the pharmacy that cares. Halifax Street, St. George's. Natural Cool, Spiceland Mall Grand Dance. Cool clothes for cool people. The Computer Store Grenada Limited, Spiceland Mall Grand Dance. The Gamers Paradise, with headsets by Razer, Conair, JBL, Sony, Astro, Logitech, and more. And Island Catering, without a doubt, the best food and catering service on the island. Pharmacare, the pharmacy that cares. Halifax Street, St. George's. Affordable access to care, a wide range of prescription drugs, medical supplies, health and beauty items, diabetic testing supplies, immune system support products, vitamins, supplements, and lots more. Visit us today or call 440-2165. Ask about or call in prescriptions, discounted items, and special delivery requests. Kittens Pharmacare. Care, convenience, expertise. We've got it all. Okay, so we're going to move on. Um, hold your questions. We're going to get them at the, at the end. I'm going to ask uh, Jackie Cherbin Weeks to introduce um, the next presenter. Yeah. Okay, I will have to unmute my mic. Uh, yes. The next presenter is Dr. Erica Smith. I've not had the pleasure to meet Dr. Erica Smith, but I've heard so much about her over the years, um, especially being a member of ECHO, and your name always seems to come up somewhere to do with copyrights. It's always people refer to you and always refer I always refer about information from you. So it's my pleasure to introduce you today, Dr. Smith. And I'll just give a little bit of information about you to our listeners and our panelists. Um, ja Jackie, Smith. before you go on, we lost your video. If you could turn it back on for us, we're not seeing you anymore. Okay, um, are you seeing me now? Right. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, but you were hearing me, right? So I'll go ahead with the introduction and information about Dr. Erica Smith. And she has been the chief executive officer of the Barbadian Collective Management Organization, the Copyright Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers Incorporated, that's COSCAP, since 2000. She is treasurer of the Association of Caribbean Copyright Societies, that's ACCS, and the former chair of the ACCS Management Committee. She has, she has undergraduate and undergraduate degrees or undergraduate degrees in management and law and postgraduate degrees in international business management, intellectual property law, and international sports law and management. She has done executive studies in corporate governance with the Harvard Kennedy School and the Certified Management Accountants at CME. She is also a partner in the consultancy firm Conceptualization Incorporated and has undertaken research and written several papers on the commercialization and development of the intellectual property regime in the Caribbean. Through Conceptualization Incorporated, she has also presented various training programs in intellectual asset management, 
Dr. Smith has tutored for six years in various subject areas at the University of the West Indies, including international business, business policy and strategy, and Caribbean business development. Erica K. Smith has undergraduate degrees in law and management and a master science degree in international business, ALM, LLM in intellectual property law and LLM in international sports law and management. She has recently awarded her doctorate and her dissertation was focused on copyright management. Erica has authored various business management courses and is a head tutor with the WIPO Academy. Over the years, she has implemented numerous projects for various regional and international agencies and governments. Her clients include the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, the Jamaican Intellectual Property Office, the Jamaican Business Development Corporation, and the Caribbean Development Bank, Compete Caribbean, and the REACH project of the Inter-American Development Bank, the International Federation of Phonographic Industry, and the Caribbean Export Development Agency. So with all that information, we know that she's an expert on copyright and also on business and also the legal aspects. So we now have Dr. Erica Smith. The floor is yours. Please go ahead with your presentation. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. And to be honest, if I wasn't Bajan, I would want to be Grenadian. <laughs> I love Grenada. Um, so I'm not going to take too long, and I promise not to be too technical. Uh, but first, uh, picking up on what Keith was saying about the need for data, so there is a regional association for the copyright organizations called the Association of Caribbean Copyright Societies, ACCS. And we have just launched what we hope will be the biggest regional survey for the music industry. Um, we are really asking industry stakeholders from across the region to respond to the survey. We have an economist who's working with us who will do the analysis. And this is to inform um, our advocacy to Caribbean governments. It is really important we have your voice. I know doing surveys can be a pain, but one of the challenges has always been the low levels of response. So if you look at online for on Facebook for C, as in the letter C, C note Caribbean, or you go to your local copyright organization's website, you should see the survey there. So please take a few minutes to help us build that data that uh, Keith mentioned so much. So as I just mentioned, there's a regional association. Um, today's topic is very broad, so I'm going to be very specific and focus on the issues of copyright management. And I'm going to get to the digital issues, but I think it is important that we deal with some really foundational challenges that persist in the region. Um, so the ACCS comprises a uh, collective management organization or copyright society, uh, COSCAP in Barbados, BISCAP in Belize, JCAP in Jamaica, COT in Trinidad, and for the OECS, we have ECHO. <laughs> so these are organizations and the ACCS have all existed for at least 20 years. In the case of COP, they were around since 1985. And just to clarify, collective management in the Caribbean or copyright management is not new. Um, it has been around since the days of colonialism, starting in the 1940s. So this idea of copyright being something new to the region is a fallacy. Um, what happens all about, at a minimum 20 years ago, is that there was an understanding for the need for national entities 
that would be more representative of um, regional stakeholders and our environment. And so you had these organizations started and there have been some successes. So right now we count almost 12,000 members and these include songwriters, music publishers, performers, and the producers of song recordings. In the case of Grenada, um, I think your membership would speak primarily to songwriters and music publishers. But um, as to be clear, um, there are rights for producers and performers, which are very similar to copyright. And those are neighboring or related rights. And we need to really push to get um, representation, greater representation for those industry participants. Another achievement has been international recognition. I'm told that we are very hard on ourselves in terms of our introspection in the Caribbean. But globally, we are recognized. Um, we are part of all the international federations and so on. We are part of the global dialogue. And so I have to acknowledge that achievement. We, we collect, prior to COVID, we were collecting about US 4 million, 5 million in the region. I've noted that as an achievement, but actually it could also be seen as a challenge um, because in the grand scheme of things, and if you think back to the um, information that Keith provided, um, it's a drop in the bucket. So we'll put aside the achievements and, and get into the challenges. So I think in one word, uh, a lot of our challenges can be summarized as, or, or not one word, maybe three, lack of respect. Um, there is a lack of respect for the culture and creative industries in the region. Um, there is a lack of respect for copyright, which, which could be partially caused by a lack of understanding and education as to how it all works. But there's a resistance to learning and understanding as well. I think it's very deliberate. And unfortunately, there's a big lack of respect amongst the industry stakeholders themselves. And, and I suppose that is the biggest problem of all. So the copyright organizations work to represent our almost 12,000 members in an environment that is extremely tough. Um, and the, to be honest, and, and I think we need to have some broad bats and very open and honest conversation, um, a lot of challenges caused by our own membership because we are members organizations. And unless we have the support of members, the active support of members, we will always be weak. So going back to our operating environment, um, how, how does it work? To be very brief, the copyright organizations license some of the rights granted under copyright um, that are owned by our members and international affiliates. These rights are rights that are difficult for individuals to manage themselves. So it's done collectively. We only make money from licensing. So money has to come in and then we're able to pay out. And this basic equation doesn't seem to be understood. If money isn't coming in, there's nothing to pay out. So we are in, a, in an environment where a lot of people who use music do not pay for copyright licenses. Um, and they, a lot of people resist it. Some reasons may be legitimate, um, but let's understand that if you're using music, so if you have a business, um, let's say you're a nightclub, that business is premised on the use of music. 
And just as you know, you will need to pay for drink, security, electricity, and everything else. You, you must understand that you need to pay for the music. So the reality is there's a very, very high level of resistance in the region. And on the other hand, you have a situation where you have some really uninformed, unrealistic expectations of membership as well. We're not charities. And we're not just collecting the 4 million. You actually mentioned it sounds like a lot of money. It's not. Um, a lot of that has to go to out internationally because we're not only representing locals. And we have to think about how much international music is actually used in the region. But we are held to account. So we have to pay out to all the rights owners identified whose music is, is performed. What happens is, um, fortunately and unfortunately, um, the, the barriers to entry so if, uh, are quite low. So uh, a lot of people who believe they have the ability will record a song um, send it to a radio station and join the copyright society and then have some demands in terms of royalty payments. Um, it doesn't matter if the music is actually popular and performed a lot. It doesn't matter that you only have one song uh, in 10 years and that's it. The expectations are generally very high and unrealistic. And Particularly with the COVID situation, what's happened is we've seen um, a lot of persons joining new membership. So they have some time, they create some music, they join the organization. So our membership has been going up even during the COVID environment. And the income has dropped dramatically. And it's going to be a problem because we, we, we don't have money to pay out or very, very little money to pay out against the backdrop of increasing membership. And to explain that to members is very difficult because the, 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 there, there's no excuse possible. We have to pay out the money and there is no money. So we, we really need to work on understanding how the system works. Um, during the COVID-19 situation, sister organizations internationally were able to rely on revenue from broadcast and cable, as well as from digital sources. None of those are available to us in the region. Um, the level of compliance uh, amongst broadcast and cable operators as the largest users of music is extremely low in the region. And unfortunately, we have to spend a lot of time in court and pursuing legal recourse to get that sorted. And, and this has been going on for over 20 years. And we'll get to the challenge of digital. But the fact is, the region is, is, has no real presence in the digital music market. And as Keith mentioned, unless we really take some steps to reverse that, um, we will see that over time, we will just have no participation in the digital music environment, at least not from a money-making perspective. We already mentioned the lack of understanding of the music business and how things work generally, so not just copyright, but how the business works. We have low levels of investment coupled with low levels of return. We have the challenge of seasonality and this focus on carnival. And we need to figure out how do we ensure we have a year round level of music production and, and to really lessen this focus on carnival and competition and, and, and making it all very seasonal and in effect adding a certain level of um, or, or in effect lowering the viability of the music industry. Um, we mentioned the lack of effective marketing and to, to that I would add distribution. 
uh, we also spoke in some sense about the lack of uh, networking and institutional development, building trade organizations, etc. And something we need to really deal with is the level of competitiveness, the standard of work. So, um, like I said, now with technology and the internet, it's relatively easy for someone to record and put out a song. Now you may get lucky and, and it may be fairly popular. But if we're talking about truly monetizing and being globally competitive, we need to be talking about creating music for a global market. And there are some challenges there. And, and, and this speaks to standards. Mm. Another inherent challenge for the region is that of scale. And, and this is a problem too for the corporate organizations and something we too really need to deal with. Um, the regional market is comparatively small. And the corporate organizations are micro-sized. We are extremely tiny. And, and, and this is why it irks me when we are compared with uh, you know, one of the big societies in the US. So in Barbados, we have just under 1,300 members. 1,300, that's it. And we are compared to a society that has almost 200,000 members and generates a billion US dollars annually. Um, there is no comparison. But the fact is we, we operate in an environment that's very small and it's very difficult to generate economies of scale and to operate efficiently. So we have to figure out how we will deal with that. And then um, Keith mentioned the issue of documentation and the use of international standards. So especially in the digital environment, for those of you who are active or, or have your music being uh, distributed on the digital platforms, you know, for example, that you have to use the ISR, the International Standard Recording Code, the ISRC. And if you didn't know that, then I'm telling you, you aren't ready. So you really need to build an understanding of this idea that creatives, you know, can't be bothered with the business. I, I, I rubbish that. I'm saying you don't have to be experts, but you have to have an understanding of the industry you're operating in. The, you know, you join this, the Copyright Society, you may give us some information initially on the songs you've created, and then you don't hear from you on t unless you're asking about money. You keep releasing music, you don't give us the information. Somehow we're expected to know what music you have, um, who are the owners of in it, what proportion of ownership they have in it. And, you know, th this is a real challenge for the region. Um, really poor documentation. And this goes back to our understanding of the responsibility of the industry participants. So, those are the general challenges that I wanted to speak to before I got to the specific issue of the digital environment. And I have to be careful how I speak about this because it's actually the situation in the region is very complicated. So, um, the primary challenge the societies in the region are facing right now is um, actually a legacy of the colonial past, which has informed the regulatory framework in the Caribbean, um, which it, it, it means our market is in essence very open. And what that has meant has been the entry of competition as far as the management of rights in the digital sphere concerned. So um, we are part of a grouping called Latin Autor. 
the copyright societies were way large and small recognized that because of the huge um, numbers of performances which take place online, it is very challenging to do undertake the administration, the analysis of all those performances, etc. Um, it is also understood that we needed to come together and offer pan-regional licenses because you know the digital environment is it's borderless. So um, rather than offering or trying to negotiate, say a license is Spotify for Barbados alone, which would never happen, we understood that we needed to be part of a bigger group. So we are part of the Latin American group and called Latin Tour, and they negotiate licenses for all of Latin America with the digital platforms. And we only recently joined that group in, and we were very excited because they have seen tremendous growth in earnings from, from digital music use. Um, but for the English-speaking Caribbean, it was soon very apparent that our situation would be very different. And this is because, and I'm trying to keep it simple, for the Latin American countries, they, um, you cannot, as an outsider, simply license in those territories. You have to be a recognized collective management organization. So that means everything is very centralized. And to, if you're a Spotify and you, you need a license um, to have your platform in Latin America, you need to, you have to go to the societies. And since there is one grouping, you can go to Latin Autor and get the license for all the territories. In the English speaking Caribbean, because our market is open, what has happened is your Spotify, you need to cover the English speaking Caribbean. You go to Latin Autor on behalf of the societies in the Caribbean. And the reality is we cannot issue a complete license because some of the international players, the big publishers in particular, um, decide, no, we will issue licenses directly. So you need to go to them for the rights they control. And then some of the societies have decided to be competitive as well. So you need to, so they've withdrawn some of their rights. So you need to also go to them as well as to the Caribbean societies. And so you're a Spotify, you say, no, that's just, that's a lot of hassle for such a small market. So because of that reality, um, in terms of being able to issue licenses to these big platforms, it's been a really slow process. We've had to figure out a negotiating position and try to make it um, as easy and attractive as possible to, to get these platforms licensed. Um, for those of you who are active on YouTube, you would know unless they have a license for the Caribbean, a specific YouTube platform for the Caribbean, um, you can't monetize. So from a copyright society perspective, we have been working really hard and we will soon hopefully um, make, we, we got Spotify license and, and we're negotiating with all the major players, but it is a difficult, difficult process. Um, on top of that, um, you have, it's also a very muddled process because in, in their effort to have that online presence, Caribbean creators have been signing with aggregators, so companies that build catalogs to license. Because, for example, with Apple, you as an individual with your two songs can't go and license your music to Apple Music. You need to have a much bigger catalog of work. So, so you have these entities called aggregators that pull everything together, build these catalogs, and then license. And what has been happening there is an issue of documentation and being able to ensure 
that the right people get paid. So this is where they were licensed around the world. Um, so to, to Spotify, for example, in Asia. So it's a mess. And we are trying to work through, and we have some assistance sorting out that mess. But um, even with the success of getting a license with Spotify, and trust me, they didn't pay a lot. And, and they didn't pay a lot for the initial year of operations for the simple reason that there was no data to tell them or us um, the potential value of the market. So we were all estimating. And unless regional people go there and subscribe and support their artists, their regional artists, I don't mean listening just for free. You have to be actively subscribing as well. The fact is that the returns to the region will be very low. Um, the pattern will follow that of the traditional environment where you see a lot more um, Anglo-American pop music use, international music use um, on these platforms and you will see of regional um, players. So even as we are achieve, as we achieve successes with these digital platforms, um, without regional support, and, and, and this is another issue in the traditional environment as well, and it speaks to the question of local and regional content. Um, unless we really go and support our own, we're not going to see the returns. So to me, the digital environment really is an extension of what's been happening in the traditional environment. If you think about it, um, once you go online, Caribbean people are usually very, very reluctant to pay. They, you know, the idea is everything is free. So, so that is something we don't need to work past. In terms of regional platforms, um, yes, there have been some developing. Um, most of them really are not generating anything substantial financially. So we, we, we wouldn't see um, much to pay regional creators. Some of them don't have, are, the requisite licenses have not all been obtained. So, you know, it doesn't matter how well they do. Um, the returns are not what they should be. So we have a lot of work to do. A lot. And like I said, initially, it, it, it's a question of respect. If we truly are governments and the industry players, and when I say industry players, I don't just mean the songwriters and performers and so on. I'm also talking about the festival operators, promoters, etc., because that's the news, they're all part of the industry. And until we take and make the effort to understand how it works and to understand that by having a well-functioning, viable regional industry, we will see returns or better returns to all, which, you know, will have a roll-on effect. Um, we, we will just be button heads. And I can tell you after 20 years in the industry, and I, I am not so... I mean, I'll keep trying. I, I can't help, but I, I'm not as optimistic as I was before because we're really going in a circle and we need to get serious. So um, that's it in a nutshell. I, I didn't want to get too complicated, but I'm happy to respond to queries. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Smith. Um, Yes, uh, it's, it's a lot of food for thought, you know, and you've said it right, huh? it's a matter of respect. We've got to respect our own, and I think a, a lot of the problem starts right there. Until we respect ourselves and each other, um, we are going to be spinning top in mud. 
as, as we say. But anyway, we'll come back to all of that. I want to open up the floor to, to questions. Anybody who has um, a question can now um, ask it, and starting off with those in the bubble there with you, um, and then we'll take it outside of there. We also had an earlier question. He had to leave. The, 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 um, this week they're celebrating, I think, 10 years, the, the Spice, Spice Mouse Mass Corporation. Corporation. Yeah. So our CEO had to run off, but he left a question. Now, Jenna, could you read that yeah. question? He I think did have to mm. run off, and he mm. sends his apologies but he left um, some comments for us in the chat. I'll just go through now. He says, I agree with all the comments made on the need for more education on IP and copyright for creatives. But creatives must make it their business to get the knowledge and be on the ball with issues that concern their craft and profession. Um, let me just go again and make it a little bigger because I'm forcing my eyes here. Right. Where was I? Right. So he made some points. How many creatives are logged on to, the, to this important discussion today? Yeah, how many of you are actually here? Spice Mouse Corporation recently co completed a project on the branding and commercialization of carnivals in Dominica, St. Lucia, and Grenada. Um, this project was spearheaded by Expo St. Lucia and funded by the Caribbean Development Bank. Consultations with creatives form the basis for a training for creatives on IP. Again, not many creatives logged on to the training. Consultations with creatives form the basis. Okay, I'm reading double now. <laughs> <laughs> However, all is not lost. The opportunity is still there for creatives to educate themselves on IP and copyright. The toolkit is available for the offices from the offices responsible for Carnival on the three islands. It is very comprehensive. It's a very comprehensive document which provides the tools to help the creatives make money from their craft. Um, he said you can contact the Spice Mass Corporation and he left the contact number 44006 Two one, or you can email him, email him CEO at SpiceMassGrenada dot com. Great. So yeah, some feedback there from again the Spice, the CEO Spice Mass of Spice Mass Corporation, Mr. Kelvin Jacob. He had to leave us, but he left us some very pertinent information, and I hope the creatives. Um, if you're not logged on, I hope your friend tell you about this. Somebody tell you about this and you can go back and get the information. Yes, we will have this. Um, we will, again, for those who would have missed it, we would, those who missed it, um, we would have it posted on the um, Greens Music to the World. Uh, or actually, the GBN. Um, where would we have it, really? Um, GBN. So it's going to be on, it's, it, it will remain on YouTube, um, mm -hmm. GBN's YouTube channel. You can go on and, and, and get it. You can also get it on GBN's Facebook right. page. It's going to be a permanent feature there. Right. Um, you have a comment on this WhatsApp. Somebody saying good program, but it's beginning to show diminishing returns. Um, folks, you can call us if you have any comments, questions to make, um, 435-2041. But we'll go back to our, um, our panelists there. Andrew hits. Philip, as a, as a musician, a, a creative, did any of, of um, Dr. Smith's presentation resonate with you? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, for me specifically, one of the thoughts I want to share is that in a, in a, large, in a large part, uh, people don't know what they don't know, especially when in regards to creatives, right? And hello? We're hearing you. Yes. Go ahead. You can hear me. Okay, great. We yeah, lost thought, the video uh, a bit, thought, though. I thought you said. Make sure your video is on. Okay, let me see. We lost your video. Yeah. Yeah, can you hear me now? Can you see me now? Hearing and seeing. Go ahead. All right. Uh, let me just put this in airplane, airplane mode. Sorry about that. Hello? You still there? Go ahead. Okay, great. Sorry. Yeah, so um, as I was as I was saying, um, creatives get a lot of flack for not being for not being proactive. But one of the things, one in the defense of creatives, before I ask the question that I had in mind, the the lack of infrastructure creates a great problem. People generally don't know what they don't know, and especially if they don't know how or where to go to find information, that makes it even more difficult. Um, so in other industries, there are generally easier paths of getting information. Like a lot of artists, um, even artists that have been in successful in terms of touring and so, have no clue about publishing. They don't understand publishing. They don't understand copyrights. They don't understand the different um, intricate details of the music business 
and they don't know where to go to find the information. Some, some copyright organizations make that information readily available, and then there are other instances where if you go and ask, then you'll get that information. But if you don't know what questions to ask, you don't know how to get it. So that, that being said, um, I, I go back to Dr. Nurse's uh, points uh, on the fact of the infrastructure. Once infrastructure can be put in, more infrastructure can be put in place to get the, to make information a lot more accessible, then the artists uh, and the practitioners of the arts can therefore participate in getting more educated on all the different details. So I believe one of the aspects, because for example, in my case, I've learned a lot because I've traveled and worked in different places with different people in different industries. And therefore I was able to be in rooms and get information and be, and be pointed in the direction of the information. Sometimes they'll tell me, oh, talk to this person or talk to that person or go to this website or go to this publication and you'll get information. Or there's a seminar going on in this place and you can get X, Y, Z information. And had I not been in some of these rooms, I still would not know a lot of this information. And the, the, some of our local genres, reggae is not necessarily as um, affected as much as the, by this, but Calypso and Soka are highly affected by the fact that it is a diaspora and local cultural. It's tied so deeply into the culture locally and in, within the diaspora that if anything happens to that, for example, with COVID, where all the activities like carnivals and fets and all of these things were shut down. Most people saw that the, the everything, all the, not just the revenue, but all the attention just got cut off. Like listeners who would have been tuned in within a certain period of time because there's a carnival coming up, all of a sudden stopped listening and are listening to other music because the, the audience as well as the practitioners are so um, programmed to be okay this is that time of the year that i participate in this and because seeing that we have no infrastructure in place to keep that push going on a general basis a lot slips through the cracks so i believe the infrastructure point is a is even more vital than we really think about it for the fact that without having some form of of central location um, where education can be shared uh, it is difficult for people to even try and think of what questions they ask when they don't know what they don't know. Um, the question that I have to, that I would like to ask for, um, for a little bit more uh, explanation is the ease of access, not just for the, yes, I understand the point of, you know, some people would join copyright organizations and the bar for entry is so low, but the access in terms of finding, how should I say? Finding information on on how to improve your craft to be more viable in the mar in the world marketplace, that access. So I guess it all boils right back to that same education thing. But at the end of the day, um, I would like to know how easy is it for artists to get information, like for example, on songwriting and and uh, having better structure in your songs, or what techniques you can apply to get you know your songs placed in different situations. For example. Getting placements in movies were mentioned earlier by um, Mr. Nurse and access to that. There are people whose jobs are to find music to get them placed in, in movies. And so how, how can we get more information in, on anything in, re in regards to copyrights? Is there a website besides having you know, emailing or getting um, calling up a specific phone number are there websites in place are there programs in place where there's consistent ads in places where you know people would be that would allow people to know okay you can access this website at this time or there's this publication that happens every week or every month where um at this point that you can get this information and you can try and get yourself educated is there um how many pr uh, programs like that are there available presently Okay, so part of the problem is that the, these activities do happen, um, but they're scattered. So there have been over the years a number of songwriting camps and, and different training activities. Um, we, meaning the Association of Caribbean Copyright Societies, have been, um, especially since COVID, been doing quite a number of webinars and so on. And we had 
For example, a training program that was supported by Complete Caribbean that was held mid, mid to late last year. It, made, it had four um, parts and it was very, very detailed. It's all available on the website. It should be available on your local CMO's website, but um, accscaribbean.com. Um, we've started putting everything on that website that we do and any links we are aware of. So part of the problem, I think, is um, th these initiatives are happening all over and there's no communication. So I may hear about an activity somewhere that it would have been great if, you know, wider participation and so on was allowed. So I do take what you're saying in terms of um, centralizing as much as possible and maybe having a higher level of information sharing. But um, a, a lot of educational programs do happen. It's just the information is not being effectively shared. On the other hand, um, and I know Keith mentioned it, um, we do need to have comprehensive programs, not necessarily at a high academic level, but certainly what he's proposing to do at the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College in St. Lucia would be very, very useful. Um, but what I'll do is, like I said, we already have information. Um, and, you know, I'm sorry if there's not a higher level of awareness. Part of that also points back to our lack of resources, but I can tell you that um, anything we do, I definitely go online and post it and, and do the ads and so on, try to get it out. Um, the societies would need to step up, I suppose, and really try to be more effective in, in getting information out there. Um, but what I can undertake to do is to try to build out our repository more. So insofar as we are aware of activities and insofar as the information is made available and it's recorded and so on, I can undertake, I can pledge that we would try to at least ensure our platform um, has as much as possible. But certainly what we do is recorded and made available there. But I, t I take the point. Um, but having said so, um, the fact is, for example, when Costco is doing an educational program, we email all of our members, we send out WhatsApp, we do advertising. So of the 1,300 members, we feel fantastic if we can get 50. So, so there's still a, some level of disconnect in terms of, of the artists and creators themselves also making that effort. But we try really, really hard. To, um, to have a high level of participation because sometimes you spend a lot of money putting everything together and you don't want to do that for 20 people, but that happens more often than not. Okay, goes back to the point um, the Spice Man CEO was making about um, the creatives taking um, a more active role in, in, in their development. Um, we have some feedback from last Facebook. Um, one submission is the things that Erica Smith is saying about the music and the global market equally applies to the visual arts industry. A young artist might get lucky and sell a few paintings, but reaching an international level is a whole different game. Constant study and learning is absolutely necessary. Another submission, the main problem in the Caribbean is a very small size of the local market. We are also targeting the wrong part of the world. Europe is far more lucrative and accessible than the U.S., um, where we have been targeting. Um, another submission, questions for Keith and or Erica. How important is the functions of the copyright collective societies like ECHO and COSCAP to the process of development that we speak of today? Um, Dr. Smith or... Nurse, either of you, either of you want to take it? Uh, I'll go first. Um, I believe that the copyright societies, especially in environments like ours where there's not 
a lot of structure. And, and these organizations have currently are, are probably the most structured and well-resourced organizations that exist in, at least in music in the region. And as the digital market becomes more and more important, um, the resources to be able to really track and administer performances in, in those markets um, really will rely on the corporate organizations. Over the years, the, you know, there have been arguments about the, they're becoming less, um, less important. And in fact, you're seeing the opposite. And well, I didn't, I, I thought it was a little outside of today's conversation, but I think we also need to look at ensuring that as we develop institutions, we are developing institutions that are specifically responsible, responsive, sorry, to our needs. And this includes the corporate organizations. So my mission is to try to shape, at least in the case of COSCAP, to shape an entity that, yes, fulfills its duty as a corporate a collective management organization, but to understand that how those organizations are defined, how the mandate of those organizations have been defined, say, in Europe, um, might not necessarily be what we need in the region. So in summary, I think there is a really important role for the corporate organizations. I think it's a pity that they have the challenges they have and, and lack certain resources. But if we can strengthen our position and really improve um, how we function, I think it would work, work wonders for the region. And, and not only for music, by the way, but we need to think of it regionally for um, the, 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 the person just mentioned the visual arts and photography and other areas in the creative industries. Keith? Yeah, I, I just want to jump on that last point that Erica made. Um, music is the sector in the region that has had the highest level of monetization, and particularly monetization in terms of intellectual property, meaning copyright. And so it has created this infrastructure with all the various copyright management organizations across the region and creating even an association of copyright societies. And so um, it is actually the strongest area of infrastructure in the Caribbean for the creative industries. Even with all the challenges that Erica described, um, it is by far the strongest ecosystem within the creative sector in the Caribbean. Bar none, there's no other entities that even come close. This is a cause for both celebration and for concern. Um, so the copyright societies are able to generate data about their membership, royalties. They can tell you where the music is being performed generally, et cetera, et cetera. We need to strengthen that and make it uh, more seamless in terms of the data that is being captured. We also need to then strengthen these institutions so that they can um, um, work in other areas, book publishing, um, visual and performing arts, um, you know, photography, um, um, the visual arts, and so on. So we do need to build out the infrastructure. Now, this is absolutely critical going forward because the way in which the global economy is shifting, um, fintech and blockchain are going to be the mechanisms by which we monetize creative content. And if we are not jumping onto these new technologies in the next, I would say in the next two to three years, um, the region is going to be left even further behind. Um, this has become super urgent. Um, in the good old days, we used to think that this is about the arts. And yes, it is. The arts is the bedrock. Um, because yes, it is the art form 
that is the thing that we are trying to monetize. But if you don't put in place the mechanisms and the infrastructure to facilitate this monetization process, then more, more um, less people will be encouraged to go into the industry and so ultimately will undercut our identity as a people and as a region. So this is not just about making money, it's also about securing our sense of identity. And I can't begin to underscore how important this is. Because I know sometimes there's a debate, well, come on, we should leave the arts to be just the arts. And I'm like, well, uh, if you look at the history of success in the region, for example, Trey and Tobago Carnival, it was one of the first carnivals in the world to be monetized and to be commercialized. The success of Trey and Carnival, even with all its faults, has to be um, linked to the early level of commercialization that took place in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, so we often are not learning from our best case scenarios or from our history. We keep repeating the learning process rather than building on it. So I want to really endorse some of what Erica said about the training dimension. Uh, too much of the training is being done um, scattered, ad hoc, and fragmented. It needs to be consolidated and made accessible, and this is now increasingly possible in a digitalized environment. Okay, and That's one of the things I'm offering to do through the Saratulish Community College so that we don't have this repeating concern about how do we access the information. But the po last point, though, is that um, the people who work in the sector, who make a living from the sector, need to up their game. There's no if, buts, or maybes. Um, you need to get better organized if you're in the industry. You need to do the homework, the prepping. Um, you need to do your own training, uh, etc. It's up to people like Erica and myself and others to make the, the, um, the training accessible. But, um, you know, we can't, um, you know, the, the horse has to come and drink the water. Um, it has to make its way to the water to drink it. So I, I'll end on that note and say that um, copyright and copyright administration is the key lifeblood for the creative sector going forward. There's no if, buts, or maybes about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Gittins. I, I see we've gone over time, but yes, the discussions were so very relevant. <laughs> it, was, it was certainly worth Sirah's it. Siraj Dakari is trying to get on, but we, yeah. on we're out of time. We're out mm. the, the studio is putting us out. We do have to wrap. <laughs> I'm thinking you need a part two. We're going to have to look into that. But listen, um, I just want to say that um, we really, really appreciate the time and the sharing of the expertise that both Dr. Nurse and Dr. Smith have given us this morning. Mm -hmm. um, great information. Um, information for not just for us to go in one year and out the other, but information for us to act on. Right. Information that can make our, our nations, our culture, our music, and all the other creative industries um, that are part of us better. And also help us to monetize and get something out of them. You know, we focus on, on certain, uh, we can include this mm -hmm. in, in our economy, you know, or in our um, economic development. And so, again, a big thanks to our two presenters. I want to also encourage the listeners, thank everybody who joined in this morning and listened in this morning. I want to encourage you to go do that survey that Dr. Smith to spoke about. Um, I also want to let you know that, um, of course, Dr. Nurse has a whole bunch of publications, but there's this particular one I want to mention, the Digital Creative Economy and Trade, Strategic Options for Developing Countries. Um, it's available, I think, online. So you are, if not, it must be available um, where you get books, you know, Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. So please go look for it and um, purchase it and read it. Um, and I also want to thank our 
personal master control, mm -hmm. Timon. Timon. I want to thank Timon. I want to thank our panelists, the other panelists who joined us. I thank you all for being there and asking the questions. And every one of you who um, again listened and participated, we didn't get every question and comment, but we have it there. And we want to finally say that all of this will be available um, on the GBN Facebook page and the GBS YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. So spread the word. And if you know a friend, if you know somebody who needs to have this information and didn't get it this first time, or if you want to go back to recap like I will, then you go to the G uh, GBN Facebook page, YouTube channel, Green's Music to the World, and you will get all of this information. Any parting words from you? No, I think you, 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 you said it well. And um, I, I, I like the presentation, especially from um, Dr. Smith. We, we, we got where we need to go. And Dr. Smith highlighted the challenges and the onus is on the creatives. It's on us now to position ourselves to take advantages of the changes in the market exactly. and monetize um, our work or, and work. Our, or, or copyright. Mm -hmm. um, we need to protect ourselves. Yeah, but thank you. Yeah, well, thank thank you all. And again, thank you, Dr. Smith, and thank you, uh, Dr. Nurse. We will be in touch. I'll be in touch with you after this. Uh, we're going to master control. We're going to take um, our sponsors' credits and good say goodbye to everyone. Before we yeah. say goodbye, mm -hmm. though, I just want to say, programming note, um, don't forget, from 3 p.m. this evening, mm -hmm. we'll be going um, joining the virtual ex experience from Canada. I know you're a Can Canadian more than a Grenadian. No, no. You, you yeah. Canadian first? Canadian first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, um, the Spice Isle Festival right. live from Toronto is going to be on GBN television from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. this evening. You can check it out on GBN television. It's going to be live, all the action, lots of performers, lots of, um, what do you call them? Create clothes. Uh, fashion designers. Fashion designers, and, and so will be on display. Calypso, great entertainment, and of course, interacting with our, our folks in the diaspora. So, tune in and check out that program from 3 p.m. Right. Oh, yeah, definitely, but definitely check it out. And one, just one little correction. Yeah, my time in North America was not in Canada, oh. it was in the United States. In the United States? Yeah. I yeah, thought yeah. it was Canada. No, no, no. Uh, probably that's Simon. <laughs> yeah, I, I yeah Simon. Yeah, there. Simon, yeah. Canada. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, again, thanks, uh, Master Control. We just have um, our sponsors' credits, uh, commercials. Um, and then we'll say, we'll, we'll wrap say up. Goodbye. Thank you all. Green's Music to the World is brought to you by Gittins Pharmacare, the pharmacy that cares. Halifax Street, St. George's. Natural Cool, Spiceland Mall Grand Dance. Cool clothes for cool people. The Computer Store Grenada Limited, Spiceland Mall Grand Dance. The Gamers Paradise, with headsets by Razer, Conair, JBL, Sony, Astro, Logitech, and more. And Island Catering, without a doubt, the best food and catering service on the island. Pharmacare, the pharmacy that cares. Halifax Street, St. George's. Affordable access to care, a wide range of prescription drugs, medical supplies, health and beauty items, diabetic testing supplies, immune system support products, vitamins, supplements, and lots more. Visit us today or call 440-2165. Ask about or call in prescriptions, discounted items, and special